Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Continuing studying Srimad Bhagavatam <clears throat> as translated and presented with commentaries by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, Founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. <clears throat> and this is the, <clears throat> excuse me, Sixth Canto, Chapter 4, and Text 49. And we're hearing about Prajapati Daksha and his darshan with the Lord. Just a brief uh, comment here on why I'm reading like this and posting for anyone to see. These books and literatures that have been translated and widely distributed by His Divine Grace are being made available to anyone. What I'm doing is I'm studying them. This is why he, Prabhupada translated them and wanted them distributed so that people would read them and study them. <clears throat> As far as my position, I have no position. I'm, I have no position, really. <clears throat> and I have uh, really no ambition for any position. Um, just to try to follow the instructions of my spiritual master as best I can. And the instructions that I'm hearing are to hear and chant and read and fix my mind on Krishna. And that is my main service. So that's what I'm trying to do. And there's that nice little story about the, the um, disciple who couldn't read. This is in Chaitanya Leela. Krishna appeared only 500 years ago as Sri Krishna Chaitanya. Marvelous pastimes, wonderful pastimes. The way to understand Krishna Leela is to approach Krishna through Chaitanya Leela. But this is a wonderful little pastime where the um, <coughs> <coughs> the Lord was passing by and he noticed um, a devotee sitting quietly holding Bhagavad Gita and crying. He, tears were coming from his eyes as he was reading the Gita. But on closer inspection, could see that actually the book was upside down. And the Lord stopped and inquired, oh, why, why are you crying? What, what is making these tears come? After all, he, the book was upside down. What's going on here? <clears throat> and the devotee explained to the, to the Lord because the Lord was a disguised incarnation. <clears throat> we understand that it's the incarnation of Lord Sri Krishna, but for his pastimes, he was disguised as a, a sannyasi and a um, very ecstatic devotee, a very unusual devotee. But for his pastimes, he was keeping it secret that he's actually Krishna himself. So the devotee who was crying, reading the book upside down, uh, said to this wonderful sannyasi who had stopped and inquired from him, Oh, Prabhu, my spiritual master has instructed me that I should read the Bhagavad Gita every day. 
but I've never learned how to read. I'm not educated. I can't read. So that's why you're crying? Oh, no, no, no. I'm crying. The tears come to my eyes when I think how wonderful Krishna is, that he was driving Arjuna's chariot, that the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself, Krishna, in loving relationship with his devotee, Arjuna, was acting as his chariot driver and guiding him through the battle of Kurukshetra. I think how wonderful Krishna is. So, <laughs> Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, to say the least, was very pleased by this devotee that ah, you have realized the message of Bhagavad Gita. You have realized. So the person couldn't even read, but he had that devotion to Krishna. So we become a little enlivened when we hear these things. <laughs> and we're taking as instruction of our spiritual master that we should read every day and if possible, chant 24 hours a day, if possible. And that there are no impediments to devotional service or simply to arrange, arrange my life so that I can do that. That's my spiritual master's instruction. That's what I'm hearing from Srila Prabhupada. So we'll continue reading and studying from the Srimad Bhagavatam. <clears throat> and this is text 49. And the Lord is talking to Daksha. He's speaking to Daksha. He, the Lord has appeared in his eight-armed form, carrying all weapons. He's riding on Garuda, and he's accompanied by Narada Muni, and some eternal associates from Vaikuntha. The chief demigods are there, and it's quite an entourage on either side of him and following behind him, and they're all singing the Lord's glories and accompanying him. So it's quite a fanfare. <laughs> and Daksha is also offering prayers, so he's part of the part of the uh, activities there. And, uh, <clears throat> and the Lord is now speaking to Daksha. And he continues, the Lord continues. When the chief lord of the universe, Lord Brahma, Swayambhu, having been inspired by my energy, was attempting to create, he thought himself incapable. Therefore, I gave him advice in accordance with my instructions, he underwent extremely difficult austerities. Because of these austerities, the great Lord Brahma was able to create nine personalities, including you, to help him in the functions of creation. Okay, so the other day he was wondering, who is the father? Who is... So Lord Brahma, Daksha is one of the sons of Lord Brahma. He was created... Um, because of the austerities that Lord Brahma performed. But now Daksha, we see, is going through a similar kind of thing, that it's his service, he's inspired to populate the universe. Lord Brahma, inspired by the energy of the Lord, was attempting to create the universe and thought himself incapable. And now Daksha, the son of Lord Brahma, inspired by the Lord's energy, to populate the universe. And he's also thinking himself falling short somehow. So it's very similar. Like father, like son. He's, a, he's doing a similar thing. And Prajapati Daksha performed austerities. The Lord was pleased by the austerities. And part of the austerities was to offer these prayers. And the Lord has appeared to him. 
So Prabhupada's commentary. Nothing is possible without tapasya. Lord Brahma, however, was empowered to create this entire universe because of his austerities. The more we engage in austerities, the more we become powerful by the, by the grace of the Lord. Therefore, Rishabhdev advised his sons, Tapo divyam putrakayena satvam sudyat. Translation, one should engage in penance and austerity to attain the divine position of devotional service. By such activity, one's heart is purified. And that's the Bhagavatam 551. In our material existence, we are impure. Therefore, we cannot do anything wonderful. But if we purify our existence by tapasya, we can do wonderful things by the grace of the Lord. Therefore, tapasya is very important, as stressed in this verse. Tapasya, austerities, which means not doing something that we very much like to do. Or sometimes austerity can mean doing something we really don't want to do. This can be austerity. For, this, for the service of the Lord, where he accept to do something that we're really not inclined to do, don't really want to do, but for the service of the Lord, we might do it. For Arjuna, fighting in the battle of Kurukshetra was an austerity. He really didn't want to do it. Sometimes feasting is an austerity. You might not want to eat so, something, but there's a festival and honor the prasad. That sounds funny to say, but it can be. Tapasya. We're going to hear some more about tapasya, no doubt. Text 50. Oh, my dear son, Daksha, Prajapati Panjana has a daughter named Ak Ashikni, whom I offer to you, so you may accept her as your wife. So he's going to procreate. He's going to need a partner. And she is the daughter of Prajapati Panch Panchajana. So there are many Prajapatis, or at least more than one. 51. Now unite in sexual life as man and woman, and in this way, by sexual intercourse, you'll be able to beget hundreds of children in the womb of this girl to increase the population. So that's Daksha's service. And that's this uh, girl's service. For the service of the Lord, we can do things. For sense gratification, there's a problem. But for serving the Lord, there's no problem. Prabhupada's commentary. The Lord says in Bhagavad Gita 7.11, Dharma virudho bhutushu kamosmi. Translation, I am sex that is not contrary to religious principles. End translation. Sexual intercourse ordained by the Supreme Personality of Godhead is dharma, a religious principle. But it's not intended for sense enjoyment. Indulgence in sense enjoyment through sexual intercourse is not allowed in the Vedic principles. One may follow the natural tendency for sex life only to beget children. Therefore, the Lord told Daksha in this verse, quote, This girl is offered to you only for sex life to beget children, not for any other purpose. She's very fertile, and therefore you will be able to have as many children as you can beget. End quote. 
Srila Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur remarks in his connection that Daksha was given the facility for unlimited sexual intercourse. <laughs> in Daksha's previous life, he was also known as Daksha. But in the course of performing sacrifices, he offended Lord Shiva, and his head was replaced with that of a goat. Then Daksha gave up his life because of this degraded condition, but because he maintained the same unlimited sexual desires, he underwent austerities by which he satisfied the Supreme Lord, who then gave him unlimited potency for sexual intercourse. To be careful what you ask for. <laughs> the Lord is fulfilling all desires since time immemorial. Of course, it's also uh, a needed activity at this time because this is toward the beginning of the creation and does need to be populated. It should be noted that although such a facility for sexual intercourse is achieved by the grace of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, this fa facility is not offered to advanced devotees who are free from material desires, anyabala sita sunyam. In this connection, it may be noted that if American boys and girls engaged in Krishna consciousness movement want to advance in Krishna consciousness to achieve the supreme benefit of loving service to the Lord, they should refrain from indulging in this facility for sex life. Yeah, so advanced devotees, they're not asking for these things. They're not asking for anything other than to please the Lord. So Daksha, he still had that strong desire for sex life. It carried over from a previous life. So it can be dovetailed. And in this case, we see that the Lord made the arrangement so he could act out and also still be connected in practical service to the Lord. So Daksha is being engaged in practical service with his body. But Prabhupada makes it clear that if American boys and girls want to advance, then really they should refrain from indulging in this, this kind of activity for Krishna. This, uh, is, I always chuckle when I remember this, what happened with the seven up on the airplane. Evidently, Srila Prabhupada, whose stomach was a little upset. They were in flying from someplace to someplace, a little upset. And so when they came around with the bubbling drinks, like the 7-Up and the ginger ale, Prabhupada took a little sip because of the bubbles. Maybe it would relieve some of the indigestion. And the devotees saw this, and word spread like wildfire, oh, Prabhupada drinks 7-Up, it's okay. And devotees all over the world ran out and bought by the caseload 7-Up. <laughs> So it's not exactly like that. <laughs> um, it brought up stomach, a little upset. He took a little sip of some bubbles, maybe relieved the pressure. And then the devotees would run out and buy by the caseload to try to enjoy the seven up. It's okay, Prabhupada. It's okay to drink it. Prabhupada drank it. It's okay. No, it's not okay. <laughs> You want to make advancement, this kind of thinking is not okay. So similarly here with Daksha and his empowerment for unlimited sex life, in this case, it's a special case, it's not okay. As Prabhupada points out, he says here, American boys and girls, because he's preaching in America at the time. This is where most of the, the devotees were in America, 1975. But it holds true for anyone in the material world that um, because Prajapati Daksha had this benediction, <clears throat> he's the son of Lord Brahma, that it's not that everyone should run out and have unlimited sex for Krishna. That's not how it works, not if you want to make advancement. 
in this little section, tapasya is being discussed, austerity. So, therefore, we advise that one should at least refrain from illicit sex, knowing what a problem it is in the Kali Yuga to control the senses, very difficult. So then Prabhupada is qualifying this so we can understand what can be accepted from the fallen souls in this age. And Prabhupada is saying, therefore we advise that one should at least refrain from illicit sex. Even if there are opportunities for sex life, one should voluntarily accept the limitation of having sex only for progeny, not for any other purpose. So this is for devotees can do this. Others really cannot. Devotees can follow this instruction. Others really cannot. Because the desire, the material desires, is too strong. And without being engaged in devotional service, you don't have the strength to resist these pushings and pullings. To have sex only for progeny. And if you try to talk to a non devotee, a person who is simply engaged in material activities, they can't fathom that at all because actually there's other ways to have progeny now. They do the artificial insemination. They had just one case recently where they uh, artificially inseminated one. She had eight, what is it, octuplets. And uh, that was artificially done with injections. <clears throat> so the sex desire has been separated from the purpose that it's there for. It is there for producing nice uh, children for progeny. It's not a recreation or a sport or a pastime, but in the modern world it is. And it's a great advertising tool because it's such a strong desire for sense engagement that all the consumer products and everything are pretty much linked to this real, the strongest of the sex desire, strongest of the sense desires, the sex desire. Toothpaste, sex appeal, nice car, sex appeal, um, just everything is connected. You'll have better sense gratification if you buy our product. So Prabhupada knows the problem. It's very, very prominent in the way. It's everywhere. It's in India, too, because it's the material world. But in the West, it's very, very, very deep-rooted and prominent because of no training. There's no training. The children have no training. There's no... So it's very rampant. And uh, Cardamar Muni was also given the facility for sex life, but he had only a slight desire for it. So Cardamar Muni, he produced children also. So we'll read about him soon. Or maybe we skip that. Anyway, he's discussed in another part of the Bhagavatam, Kardama Muni. Therefore, after begetting children in the womb of Devahuti, Kardama Muni became completely renounced. Yes, and the, he, the son, Kapila Dev, incarnation of Krishna, was the son of Devahuti from that union of Kardama Muni and Devahuti. The purport is that if one wants to return home, back to Godhead, one should voluntarily refrain from sex life. Sex should be accepted only as much as needed, not unlimited. So some devotees don't need it at all. They can live quite happily and peacefully without uh, engaging in sexual activity. But most people will be disturbed by the desire 
And so this arrangement to have nice marriage, and Prabhupada says here, sex only for progeny. So they can build a Krishna conscious life, which includes sexual activity. But a Krishna conscious life doesn't have to include sexual activity. But it can be included if done in a certain way. So. One should not think that Daksha received the favor of the Lord by receiving the facilities for unlimited sex. Oh, yeah, boy, that's a good What a blessing. Oh, wow, I got favor of the Lord. I can enjoy unlimited seven up. <laughs> Later verses will reveal that Daksha again committed an offense, this time at the lotus feet of Narada. Uh-oh. Poor Daksha. Therefore, although, illicit, although sex life is the topmost enjoyment in the material world, and although one may have an opportunity for sexual enjoyment by the grace of God, this entails a risk of committing offenses. Yeah, but it's intoxicating. It can be very intoxicating, yeah. Daksha was open to such offenses, and therefore, strictly speaking, he was not actually favored by the Supreme Lord. One should not seek the favor of the Lord for unlimited potency in sex life. Mm. Yeah. Funny how Krishna will grant these things. It's not in the devotee's necessarily best interest. But Krishna will grant things like this. We have to be careful what we ask for. Text 53. <clears throat> Krishna continues. After you give birth to many hundreds and thousands of children, they will also be captivated by my illusory energy and will engage like you in sexual intercourse. But because of my mercy to you and them, they will also be able to give me presentations in devotion. So this is really a mixed uh, situation here. They will be captivated by my illusory energy, but I'll be merciful to them, and they will be able to engage in devotion. Mm. Hare Krishna. Text 54. <clears throat> Sukadev Goswami continued. So Sukadev Goswami is narrating what Krishna is saying to Daksha. And now he's come evidently to the end of that narration about Daksha and his benediction. And Sukadev Goswami continues. After the creator of the entire universe, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Hari had spoken in this way in the presence of Prajapati Daksha, he immediately disappeared as if he were an object experienced in a dream. Wow. As if he were dreaming. Hmm. Mother Yasoda had that experience when Krishna revealed his universal form. She opened his mouth. The boys were complaining. His boyfriends were complaining and playing a joke on him. Oh, he's eating dirt. He ate dirt. They wanted to see him get in trouble. So Mother Yasoda, Krishna, Krishna appearing as a child, Mother Yasoda, she said, just open your mouth and let me see if you've been eating dirt. I'll be able to see. Come on. He opened his mouth, and he revealed the universal form. Talk about dirt, right? <laughs> Revealed the entire universal form, the whole material creation, the entire cosmos. Her head was spinning. So Krishna being merciful to his mother, then he wound that vision up. And then Madhya Soda was, what was I seeing? It was like a dream or something? And then, <clears throat> so evidently, Daksha had that experience. Krishna appeared, manifest, spoke to him, instructed him, and then disappeared as if it, it were a dream. Thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports of the sixth canto, fourth, fourth chapter, Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled, The Hamsaguya Prayers Offered by the Lord, Offered to the Lord, 
by Prajapati Daksha. Okay, so Prajapati Daksha is engaging in this unlimited sex. You can just imagine how humble and uh, he was. <laughs> oh my goodness, he must have gotten the biggest false ego you can imagine having that kind of facility. This is, uh, and here we go with Chapter 5, entitled, Narada Muni Cursed by Prajapati Daksha. Oh, boy. Yeah, having the, all that sex life it means attachment. Oh, man. Okay. <clears throat> and this is the little summary. Uh, well, it's a couple paragraphs here. So we'll know what to expect in the chapter. This chapter relates how all the sons of Daksha were delivered from the clutches of material energy by following the advice of Narada, who was therefore cursed by Daksha. Influenced by the external energy of Lord Vishnu, Prajapati Daksha begot 10,000 sons in the womb of his wife, Panchajani. These sons, who are all of the same character and mentality, were known as the Haryasvas. Ordered by their father to create more and more population, the Haryasvas went west to the place where the river Sindhu, now the Indus, meets the Arabian Sea. In those days, this was the site of a holy lake named Narayana Saras, where there were many saintly persons. The Haryasvas began practicing austerities, penances, and meditation, which are the engagements of the highly exalted, renounced order of life. However, when Srila Narada Muni saw these boys engaged in such commendable austerities, simply for material creation, he thought it better to release them from this tendency. Narada Muni described to the boys their ultimate goal of life, advised them not to become ordinary karmis to beget children. Thus, all the sons of Daksha became enlightened and left, never to return. <clears throat> Prajapati Daksha, who was very sad at the loss of his sons, begot 1,000 more sons in the womb of his wife, Panchanjani, and ordered them to increase progeny. These sons, who were named the Savalasvas, also engaged in worshiping Lord Vishnu to beget children. But Narada Muni convinced them to become mendicants and not beget children. Foiled twice in his attempts to increase population, Prajapati Daksha became most angry at Narada Muni and cursed him, saying in the future he would not be able to stay anywhere, since Narada Muni, being fully qualified, was fixed in tolerance. He accepted Daksha's curse. Text 1. Sukadev Goswami continued. Impelled by the illusory energy of Lord Vishnu, Prajapati Daksha begot 10,000 sons in the womb of Panchajani, Ashikni. My dear king, these sons were called the Haryasvas. Okay, so in the word for word, Haryasva, oh, it just says Haryasva. That's what they were called. Hari, Asva. Text 2. My dear king, all the sons of Prajapati Daksha were alike in being very gentle and obedient to the orders of their father. When their father ordered them to beget children, they all went in the eastern, in the western direction. Text 3. In the west, where the river Sindhu meets the sea, there's a great place of pilgrimage known as Narayana Saras. Many sages and others advanced in spiritual consciousness live there. Text 5. In that holy place, 
the Hariyasvas began regularly touching the lake's waters and bathing in them. Gradually becoming very much purified, they became inclined toward the activities of Paramahamsas. Nevertheless, because their father had ordered them to increase the population, they performed severe austerities to fulfill his desires. One day, when the great sage Narada saw these boys performing such fine austerities to increase the population, Narada approached them. Verses 6 through 8. The great sage Narada said, My dear Hariyasvas, you have not seen the extremities of the earth. There is a kingdom where only one man lives, and where there is a hole from which, having entered, no one emerges. A woman there, who is extremely unchaste, adorns herself with various attractive dresses, and the man who lives there is her husband. In that kingdom there is a river flowing in both directions, a wonderful home made of twenty-five materials, a swan that vibrates various sounds, and an automatically revolving object made of sharp razors and thunderbolts. You have not seen all this, and therefore you are inexperienced boys without advanced knowledge. How then will you create progeny? Okay, so Narada is sometimes speaking like this, and he's giving an analogy or a little story, an analogy, a metaphor about uh, household life. Prabhupada's commentary. Narada Muni saw that the boys known as the Hariyasvas were already purified because of living in that holy place and were practically ready for liberation. Why then should they be encouraged to become entangled in family life, which is so dark that once having entered it, one cannot leave it? Through this analogy, Narada Muni asked them to consider why they should follow their father's order to be entangled in family life. Indirectly, he asked them to find, within the cores of their hearts, the situation of the Supersoul, Lord Vishnu, for then they would truly be experienced. In other words, one who is too involved in his material environment and does not look within the core of his heart is increasingly engaged in the illusory energy. Narada Muni's purpose was to get the sons of Prajapati Daksha to divert their attention towards spiritual realization instead of involving themselves in the ordinary but complicated affairs of propagation. The same advice was given by Prahlad Maharaj to his father, Bhagavatam 755. Tatsadu manye suravarya dehinam Sada samavigna tiyama sadgrahat hivatma patam griham andakupam vanam gatoyad dariam asrayeta. In the dark well of family life, one is always full of anxiety because of having accepted a temporary body. If one wants to free himself from this anxiety, he should immediately leave family life and take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in Vrindavan. Narada Muni advised the Hariyasvas not to enter household life. Since they were already advanced in spiritual knowledge, why should they be engaged in that way, entangled in that way? So, this is the actual truth. <laughs> There is provision within uh, the ISKCON, Shri Krishna Chaitanya Sankirtan, for uh, household life. There is provision. And by following nicely, making the house the ashram, then you can be engaged in Krishna's service. And we know acharyas come from all different areas. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, uh, householder, and not just an ordinary householder. I believe uh, he had two wives. 
and there were at least 13 children. And there can be no doubt that Bhaktivinoda Thakur was an advanced Vaishnava devotee of the Lord. So there's, they can't, the Vaishnavas can be found in any, in any walk of life. But here, Narada is seeing that these boys, they're performing so many austerities already. They're so renounced, obviously renounced. So why give up renunciation? They're doing it. If the only reason they're doing it is because their father is ordering them to. Evidently, within their own hearts, they're not like lusty and they uh, want to have this and that. They're worshiping Lord Vishnu and they're following the instructions of their father. But now the spiritual master appears. The spiritual master is also a father. And the father, spiritual father. And he's saying, there's a higher principle here. There's no need for you. You're already accomplishing so nicely in renunciation. Don't give it up for this. You can go further. You can go all the way back home, back to Godhead, without getting entangled. It's a very difficult situation. And we see that with, um, was the king earlier on? Uh, was it Priyavarta? That he took up the, he didn't want to, but he took up the, uh, household life. It was his duty. His father asked him to. And also at that time, Lord Brahma came and also asked him. He was already well on the path of renunciation, but there was no one to manage properly, so he took it up. But in this case, you can see from studying these different instances, um, trace out the higher principles, always trace out the highest principle, which is Sarvanam Amparicha Cha Mamikam Sarvanam Buddha. Surrender to me. And the highest principle is surrender to Krishna. I mean, it takes different forms at different times. Arjuna wanted to perform austerities. Just let me go and become austere. And Krishna said, no. In this case, Sarvadam Amparicha Cha means I want you to fight. And Lord Brahma was performing austerities. In this case, Krishna wanted him to create the universe. But here we see Krishna's pure devotee, Narada Muni. The higher principle is not to get involved. And that is Sarvadam and Purichacha. Since they were already advanced in spiritual knowledge, why should they be entangled in that way? Text 9. This is Narada continuing. Alas, your father is omniscient, but you do not know his actual order. Without knowing the actual purpose of your father, how will you create progeny? And that's interesting. Omniscient means all-knowing. But you do not know his actual order. How will you create progeny? The actual purpose of your father. There's no purport here, so we'll go on. It's interesting. Sukadev Goswami said, now he's telling all of this to Parikshit Maharaj. Hearing these enigmatic words of Narada Muni, the Haryasvas considered them with their natural intelligence without help from others. Okay, so you do not know his actual order. Hmm. 
Hmm. Hmm. In other words, where's Krishna in all of this? Where is devotional service in all of this? It just looks like entanglement. So just following their father's order is not enough for the spirit soul if they don't see how it will bring them closer to devotional service. And in this case, it sounds like it's just Daksha telling his sons what he wants them to do. So where's Krishna in all of that? Now Narada Muni comes in and says, where's Krishna? And these seem like enigmatic words. And the Haryasvas were considering with their intelligence what this could mean. In other words, they were hearing the words of Narada Muni. It says, without help from others, so they weren't consulting anyone. They were taking instruction from the pure devotee who's bringing them into contact with their own devotional intelligence. Text 11, he's asking them to please use their devotional intelligence. The Haryasvas understood the meaning of Narada's words as follows. Okay. The word bu, the earth, refers to the field of activities. The material body, which is a result of the living being's actions, is his field of activities, and it gives him false designations. Since time immemorial, he has received various types of material bodies, which are the roots of bondage to the material world. If one foolishly engages in temporary fruit of activities, does not look toward the cessation of this bondage, what will be the benefit of his actions? Hmm. Yeah, Narada Muni sees they're standing on the edge of a precipice. If they simply follow the order of Prajapati Jaksha, they'll become entangled. And they'll be engaging in the field of material activities, fruit of activities. And so what is the use of that? Where's the benefit there? Prabhupada's commentary. Narada Muni spoke to the Haryasvas, the sons of Prajapati Daksha, about ten allegorical subjects. The king, the kingdom, the river, the house, the physical elements, and so forth. After considering these by themselves, the Haryasvas could understand the living entity encaged in his body seeks happiness, but takes no interest in how to become free from his engagement. This is a very important verse since all the living entities in the material world are very active, having obtained their particular types of body. A man works all day and night for sense gratification, and animals like hogs and dogs also work for sense gratification all day and night. Birds, beasts, all other conditioned living entities engage in various activities without knowledge of the soul encaged within the body. Especially in the human form of body, One's duty is to act in such a way that he can release himself from his engagement. But without the instructions of Narada or his representative in disciplic succession, people blindly engage in bodily activities to enjoy maya sukhaya, flicking, flickering temporary happiness. They do not know how to become free from their material engagement. Rishabdev therefore said that such activity is not at all good since it encages the soul again and again in a body subjected to the three-fold miseries of the material condition. Yamaya Sukhaya. It's um, 
thinking that solving a material problem with a material solution, but after a while the material solution also becomes a problem. Like um, the solution that is solved by a uh, hundred years ago, the seeing how to use the oil, solving so many problems, transportation problems, uh, making products like plastics that are everywhere now, and oil can be found in everything, medicines, perfumes, uh, cleaning products, fabrics, textiles, inks, it's everywhere. Uh, machines, everything has plastic in it. It's coming from oil. So, oh boy, all these problems solved. But now we see there's a problem from the oil. It's polluting everything, contaminating everything, poisoning everything. The air, the water, the ocean. The people are, have all these diseases coming from these contaminants. So that's Maya Sukaya. <clears throat> And it is uh, flickering temporary happiness. So, and the mode of passion is like that. And what in the beginning appears to be <clears throat> like nectar, but in the end is poison. This flickering temporary happiness, the end result is poisonous mode of passion. So the analogy, now if they go into greater detail about the king, the kingdom, the river, the house, the physical elements, the uh, Haryasvas could understand just from that verse. Let's read that verse again that has all the, uh, the analogy. Move back here. Okay. The great sage Narada, this is the analogy, said, My dear Haryasvas, you have not seen the extremities of the earth. There is a kingdom where only one man lives and where there is a hole from which, having entered, no one emerges. A woman there who is extremely unchaste adorns herself with various attractive dresses and the man who lives there is her husband. In that kingdom there's a river flowing in both directions a wonderful home made of 25 materials, a swan that vibrates various sounds, and an automatically revolving object made of sharp razors and thunderbolts. So hopefully we're going to hear some more about this. <clears throat> 